Today's speaker probably needs no introduction, but it's still my pleasure to introduce Wolfgang Ketterle, who I had the pleasure of working for when I was a student at MIT. Um, but just some, some brief background. Anyways, um, Wolfgang got his PhD in Munich. Um, he then continued on working at the Max Planck Institute as well as Heidelberg before finally coming to MIT in 1990. He originally came to work for Dave Pritchard, but then he stayed on get on there as faculty, where we all know in 1995, YouTube goes on condensation. And more recently, he's been doing lots of work with early on, so today he'll tell us about some of the work. Okay, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, especially since, I, since I've interacted with so many of you over so many years. Um, for this seminar, I selected one topic which cuts across a certain number of years, namely fermions with strong interactions. I will not talk about physics in optical lattices, and I will not talk about uh, some recent work with rubidium in optical lattices, because I've, I mean, my impression is, well, now it's too late to correct, but the, a seminar like this is a rather diverse audience, and you should rather explain certain things well than covering everything. And I have to say, as a director of the Center for ultra Cold Atoms, which is kind of a sister physics frontier center to JQI, we've now made the experience that we have to remind speakers to give a general introduction. Because they think we give a CUA seminar, I think I give a JQI seminar, and everybody is fluent in the language of atomic physics. But in a rich center, there are very diverse directions, ion trapping, MV center, condensed matter devices, and cold atoms. So we are now reminding speakers, if you talk about cold atoms, please go through the basics because there are people in the audience who have to learn about it. So that's my excuse to the experts in the front row. I will go through some basics. So uh, one motivation for our research on ultra-cold atoms is, of course, new materials. The new materials which harness the power of quantum physics, which harness the power of strong correlations, and uh, some of those materials have already tremendous practical importance. Uh, however, those materials are rather complicated. And in atomic physics, in ultra-cold atom physics, our approach is that we want to realize the simple manifestation of certain phenomena. So, for instance, when I would ask what is the simplest way how to realize the physics of a superconductor, well, the answer is it's a dilute gas. Surprising to some of them, but of course not to most of the people here in this audience. Those gases which we use to study the behavior of superconductors and superfluids are not just dilute gases. They are extremely dilute gases. They, we work at densities which are a million times thinner than air, but those very dilute gases, for some of them it would be just the pressure of a roughing pump, for us it's a pristine quantum system where the gases behave not only like an ordinary gas, the gases can behave like liquids, like solids, like magnets, like superconductors, if we cool them to sufficiently low temperature. So the, I often say uh, the characteristic feature of the research we are doing with ultra-cold atoms is not the ultra-low temperature. It is really the ultra-low density. If you put together a many-body system of atoms which are spaced by one micron, one micron is um, thousand times or ten thousand times larger than the atomic diameter. So then you know that those particles interact only with long-range Van der Waals forces, which are precisely known. So therefore, if you put a many-body system together at ultra-low density, you immediately know the Hamiltonian. You may not be able to solve it. You may not. You may be up for some surprises, but at least you know what the basic Hamiltonian is, and you can talk to some of your theory friends if they can do exact simulations. So for me, it is the ultra-low density which brings in a new quality in this research. But well, at ultra-low density, the forces are very weak, and you have to lower the temperature to the point that those forces dominate the behavior and not just the thermal motion. So the temperature is 
also his goal can be developed in the opposite way. The temperature is now the consequence, the ultra low temperature is the consequence of the very low density where we want to do our physics. Okay, so we work at ultra low density and still we want to see correlated forms of matter, atomic systems, many body systems with strong interaction. So the question is, how do we get strong interactions into the system? Well, the secret is, use resonant interactions, and let me explain it in the following way. When two atoms interact, and you may think two atoms scatter off each other, the moment they scatter off each other, at least temporarily, they form a molecule. And then in perturbation theory, some molecular character gets added into the wave function of the colliding atoms. Well, in perturbation theory, you have an energy denominator, and the best you can do is make the energy denominator, denominator zero. Then you have actually, at least in perturbation theory, divergent infinite interaction. That's how we tune a scattering length which characterizes the strengths of interaction to infinity. And the moment when you have resonant interaction, they are as strong as they can possibly get. There is no stronger interaction than resonance. There is no stronger interaction than diverged perturbation theory. And this is what we, called, what we call the unitary gas, a gas which has unitarity limited interactions. What it simply reflects is when in perturbation theory something goes to infinity, it will be replaced by a cutoff of the system. So if your energy, if your interaction energy in first order goes to infinity, well, it has to be replaced for fermions by the Fermi energy. But that means resonant interactions are the strongest interaction which can be realized. Uh, and this is valid for all systems. And therefore, uh, there is at least some intellectual connection between research on ultra cold fermions and research on neutrons because neutrons are fermions in a very, very different energy and density range, but their interactions are also, it's an accident of nature, almost resonant. Okay, so if we have a resonance between two atoms and a molecular state, that's what we call the Feshbach resonance. And let me, because this is crucial for all of my talk, let me briefly introduce you into how Feshbach resonances work. So I said, I want a resonance between two atoms which scatter. But if the atoms have nano-Kelvin energy, I'm asking for resonance with a precision of a few hertz. Typical molecular binding energies are 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 hertz. So you would say, well, you never find that in nature. Unless you have a knob, and a knob you can turn. So what we exploit is the fact that when two atoms form a molecule, the molecule can have a different spin structure and therefore different Zeeman shift. And now, when we change the magnetic field, the energy of colliding atoms and the energy of the molecule have a different Zeeman shift. And then, if things are chosen uh, favorably, there is a magic magnetic field called the Feshbach resonance, where the colliding atoms and the molecular state have the same energy. And this resonance means we have very rich physics. Let me just go around the resonance and tell you what different parameter regimes we can get into. Uh, of course, a side remark, I've made now the assumption that my whole Hilbert space consists of that. The dirty secret is there are many, many lower lying molecular states <coughs> and we hope that the molecules and the system doesn't couple to those lower lying states. But the lithium system I'm talking about is a very favorable system where this reduction of Hilbert space uh, is appropriate. Okay, so let's go around the resonance. Here we have, on this side of the resonance, the lowest state is a molecular state, which for that Hilbert space is stable. Over there we have an unstable molecule. For instance, if you rapidly ramp uh, the magnetic field, you can create a molecule which decays and you can measure <coughs> the dissociates and all that. So it's nice to do molecular physics, but I'm not talking about that today. Here we have atoms which attract each other. And the fact that there is attraction, you can see that uh, when I showed this avoided crossing, that the solid line is below the dashed line. And that means 
the interaction lower the energy of the colliding atoms, and on the other side of the Feshbaugh resonance, atoms look at each other. So, with, so quantitatively, uh, so atoms repel each other on one side, attract each other on the other side, and uh, when we tune across the Feshbaugh resonance, we have this dispersive shape, so we can not only change the sign of the scattering lengths, which is the normalized uh, force between the atoms, we can also make it small and make it large. Our first look at this was many years ago, uh, but it seemed that only in the last five, six, seven years uh, it has really taken off because researchers found systems where in our first demonstration, I would say the gain was not worth the pain because the Feshbaugh resonance has introduced big losses and a lot of work went simply in characterizing those losses, but then people found systems and the lithium-6 case is the most favorable one where you have really forces without any losses due to lower lying states. Um, what, what was the system in that case? The first systems were actually bosons. The first Feshbaugh resonances were studied in bosonic uh, sodium and then in bosonic rubidium. These were the workhorses at the time. And for bo uh, what happens is for fermions, we have a huge suppression of free body loop losses. Uh, if you have spin up and spin down fermions and you want to form in a free body collision, a low lying molecular state, then free fermions have to come close, but you have only spin up and spin down then you have a violation of the Pauli exclusion principle. For bosons, this doesn't happen, but people learned over the years how to work at very, very low density. And at very low density, uh, you have a more favorable ratio of binary collisions, which are what you want for equilibration and for elastic properties over three body collisions, which are usually leading to losses. So one is more fundamental, bosons versus fermions. The other one is just engineer the system in terms of density or find the speed spot as a function of magnetic field. Okay, so this is just summarizing the discussion. This is the physics we can get out of Feshbach resonances. Uh, and I want to talk today about how we implement and how we exploit these Feshbach resonances to do uh, interesting new physics using lithium-6 lithium atoms strongly interacting fermions. So the first thing I want to mention is if we stay in the ground state of the system. In the ground state of the system, we cross over from atoms which attract each other, but there is not enough uh, strengths, binding strengths, interaction strengths to create a bound molecular state. And here we have a bound molecular state. But we know that in many body physics, when we refer to <coughs> here, uh, fermions, even with infinitesimal weak attraction, have an instability to form Cooper pairs and form a BCS superfluid. So if I introduce now the concept of pairs, if we stay in the lower state of this Feshbaugh resonance, we will actually have, in a many body sense, Cooper pairs, which are very loosely bound. And if we change the magnetic field, we cross over to the limit of tightly bound pairs. And this is the physics of the bcs BEC crossover. So that means we have now, through the Feshbaugh resonance, the opportunity to take, and this is more, you can say, a blow-up of the previous slide, we can take back and forth tightly bound pairs, transform them into loosely bound Cooper pairs, and in between, we can study a new form of pairing called the crossover superfluid, which is sort of in between. Those pairs are too large to be regarded as molecules, but they are pretty much too small to be regarded as Cooper pairs. If you want to take the simple view that Cooper pairs are bigger than the spacing between those Cooper pairs. So you should maybe think of those crossover superfluid as pairs which are just elbowing each other, they just touch each other. The size of the pair is almost exactly the spacing between the pairs. And I will show you later how we were able to measure the pair size. I mentioned already the system in which we do this research is lithium-6. Uh, we simply cool lithium-6, confine it in the focus of an optical trap, and then with magnetic fields, we take the system through the Feshbaugh resonance. 
most of the work, or actually all the work I'm describing today, no, most of the work, the yeah, spectroscopy is done slightly differently, but uh, we use the two lowest hyperfine states of lithium sinks. So this is our spin up and our spin down system. So, uh, so what we have realized in cold atomic gases, uh, this is more in the spirit of quantum simulations, we have realized a Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian for S-wave fermionic superfluidity, as is usually described by BCS theory. But in contrast to previous work, we have taken this S-wave uh, BCS theory to the strong coupling limit. And this is exactly the crossover limit where uh, neither of the two simple limits, BCS or BEC, apply. Uh, the evidence for superfluidity and for the phase transition came in the form of Bose-Einstein condensation. I think everybody is familiar that if suddenly there are peaks in the density distribution in time of flight, this means Bose-Einstein condensation. Here it meant Bose-Einstein condensation of pairs or fermions. And vortices are generally regarded as the smoking gun for superfluidity. So, so this manifests at the macroscopic level the superfluid state reached with these ultra low density, ultra cold uh, fermions. Uh, now I want to just flash a few slides and show you that we've always been a also been able to microscopically characterize those pairs uh, by measuring the pair size. So how, do we, how can we study microscopically pairs of atoms? Well, one tool is spectroscopy. In particular, I have spectroscopy. Let's assume we have two atoms which are not paired, and we take the blue atom into a third state, then we simply find a very sharp atomic transition at the hyperfine frequency. But now assume that the red and the blue atom are paired. Then there is a pairing energy. And if you want to transfer the blue atom to the third state where there is no pairing, you have to provide with your IF photon an extra amount of energy sufficient to dissociate the pair. So you may naively think that this would now result into a line which is shifted by the binding energy, but that's not. But there is actually a continuum because if you have a pair which is a discrete state, you can dissociate it, but you can also dissoci dissociate it with the fragments have kinetic energy. So the onset of the continuum comes when the fragments have zero kinetic energy, then it's exactly the binding energy, and then you have a continuum, the higher the frequency is, the more energy is imparted to the two fragments. Okay, but now the important point is that uh, the two fragments fly away with kinetic energy, but the IF photon is not providing any momentum to the system. So therefore, when you dissociate an atom with radio frequency, the kinetic energy of the relative motion has to be already present in the wave function of the bound molecule. So therefore, when we measure this spectrum and when we measure what are the possible momentums, momenta for fragmentation, we actually measure what momentum components are already in the bound molecular wave function. So therefore, the width here is measuring the momentum width of the molecular wave function. Well, if you Fourier transform from momentum states, you get the spatial wave function. So dissociation spectrum measures directly the Fourier transform of the pair wave function. If the molecule or the pair is loosely bound, it has a large binding distance, then the relative momenta are low and the spectrum is very sharp. If the molecule is tightly bound, we have a broad dissociation spectrum. Um, so by doing simulations, both in the BEC and the BCS limit, we realized that we simply take a spectrum, we measure the width, and the width is proportional to one over the pair size squared. So that's what we have done a couple of years ago. So we went through the crossover 
from uh, tightly bound molecules on the more tightly bound on the BEC side to the BCS side, we saw that the widths of the spectrum and therefore the widths, the size of the bound pair, varies as expected. Let me remind you that in standard superconductors, the Cooper pair size is much, much larger than the inverse Fermi vector or the distance between fermions. I mean, this is a typical BCS picture that the wave function of the Cooper pairs is completely delocalized. And even in high TC superconductors, the pair size or the coherence length is 5 to 10 times the space in between uh, electrons. By simply measuring the widths of the spectrum, we found that at unitarity, when the scattering length diverges, uh, that we have a pair size which is almost identical to the interparticle spacing. So that shows also that uh, the higher the normalized transition temperature is, the smaller is the normalized size of the pairs. Yes? I'm used to looking at this in superconductor data where you really get no signal to look at uh, what do you attribute the little scatter beneath the, the threshold? This here? Yeah. Yes. It looks systematic, doesn't it? Yes. As far as I know, what we show here is an ideal line shape, and we have not carefully convoluted it. There are wings which would actually. Just think for a second. We learned later how to do tomographic reconstruction of the cloud, that we could take spectra in the middle of the cloud, further out, further out in the cloud. So we got, by tomographic reconstruction, uh, we, we eliminated almost completely the inhomogeneous density distribution. So, so those data points uh, are s due to inhomogeneous density and, and, and not full, the, the theory curve is not fully convoluted with the experimental dynamics. Other questions? Feel free to interrupt and ask questions. So, in other words, the fact that the size of the pairs equals the interparticle spacing is exactly confirming this cartoon picture that those pairs are just touching each other but only barely overlapping. Uh, when we performed RF spectroscopy in a situation where we had prepared the superfluid with thermal quasi-particles, well, if you have already an excitation present, then you can see anti-Stokes line, and therefore, and this is shown in red, we observed the splitting of the two lines, and the splitting between the two lines is almost a direct manifestation of the superfluid gap. In the PCS limit, it would be exactly the gap. At unitarity, you have to do a few corrections by taking approximate, by adding things in quadrature and taking square roots. But so with this IF spectroscopy, we could not only determine the pair size, but we could also observe uh, the superfluid gap. Let me mention that the characterization of uh, is fermions with attractive interaction which form pairs and form a superfluid state has been taken to a very different and fully quantitative level by my colleague Martin Zwierlein. He determined, he did a precision determination of the full equation of state. It looks very simple but it's very powerful. If you very, very carefully measure the density profile versus position in the trap, but position in the trap is also the external trapping potential, by carefully analyzing this profile and just doing some integrations and derivative, you can actually obtain the specific heat versus temperature. I'm skipping many, many steps how you go from density versus chemical potential to other thermodynamic variables. This could be a major part of the talk. It should be best given by Martin Zwerlein. What I just want to show is that here you clearly see a singularity in the specific heat, and you get a direct, unambiguous observation of the superfluid transition temperature. So this superfluid transition temperature 
is uh, the highest temperature measured, the normalized temperature in T over Tf is the highest transition temperature measured in any fermionic system. This will be illustrated uh, on my next slide. But what I wanted to point out first is that this work which kind of started in 2003 and culminated now with this very quantitative work in 2012 is a wonderful realization of a PCS BEC crossover Hamiltonian. Uh, it had a long tradition in, in the theoretical discussion, but it was only with ultra cold atoms that it could be demonstrated. Uh, let me make a few historic comments here. For quite a number of decades, many people believed that BEC and BCS are separated. It was actually Bardeen who was very adamant in saying BCS is not Bose-Einstein condensation. It's very different. So the early people wanted to make BEC and BCS as different physical phenomena as possible. However, what we know actually from this earlier work, but now confirmed experimentally, that BEC and BCS are the two endpoints of a continuum connected by a crossover. And this is shown here, uh, that if you look at the transition temperature versus the strength of interaction expressed by the inverse scattering lengths, that we have these temp transition temperatures which become exponentially small in the BCS limit. And for very, very strong attraction, when the fermions form real molecules, uh, the transition temperature saturates at the BEC transition temperature. And when I mentioned this high transition temperature very beautifully and with high precision measured by Martin Zwirlein, uh, this is the highest fermionic transition temperature. It's pretty much, you can say, when the fermions cross over from becoming bosons. That's when you have the highest transition temperature in the fermionic system. So, since I think this, the physics of the BEC BCS crossover, the fact that BEC and BCS are simply two limiting cases, I think this is very, very important and every physicist should know about it. That's why I decided I want to show you a slide with a little bit more complicated formula, but just to carry home why BCS and BEC are just two different sides of the same coins. What I want to show here is that we can start with the famous PCS wave function as found by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schriever. It's actually one of the most important wave functions in all of physics, probably as important as the Laughlin state. It's just a wave function which has an enormous beauty. It can be written down and it has so much physics in it. What was actually known already in 1957 but probably not generally shared by the community, that you can take this wave function and write it in that way. What I've done here is I've simply defined a creation operator B, which, com which consists of atomic or fermion creation operators at two opposite momenta. So if I define this fermionic pair creation operator, then it's a mathematical identity to write the BCS wave function as simply B dagger to the power n, you create n fermions, you create n fermion pairs out of the vacuum. So when you see that, you would say, but well, what is now the difference between BCS and BEC if this wave function is identical to that one? Well, the truth is we have to look more carefully at this pairing operator and this pair creation operator fulfills bosonic commutation relationships only in the limit of a small pair size. So in other <coughs> words, we could, one could have always used, and actually if I would teach superconductivity, I would probably use this as the BCS ansatz because it looks so much simpler. But, uh, but those pair creation operators, which are operators to create Cooper pairs or generalized Cooper pairs or molecules, fulfills bosonic commutation relationships only in the limit of a small pair size. So, uh, so with that 
I feel I can quantitatively justify, accurately justify this sentence that superconductivity is a kind of Bose-Einstein condensate of electron pairs. And the kind of means that those pairs are real bosons only in the limit of a small pair size. <coughs> anyway, this is for me something which we have now learned through the experiment with cold atoms, and I feel it's so general that everybody who works with superfluids and fermionic superconductors should be aware of this connection. But actually, Yes. The, so an helium-4, you've got bosonic operators, but they're only really, you can only treat them as point bosons, again, in the limit that the atom, the helium atom is, big, is small compared to the separation yes. between. So why was Bardeen so insistent that they were very different from our phenomenon? Well, doing, I mean, doing justice to Bardeen, uh, if you have this wave function, you have these pairing operators, those uh, this pair operator creates Cooper pairs. The Cooper pairs are big and fluffy. And what happens now is, when you do the B dagger to the power N, so I'm an experimentalist, I always have this visual in front of me, B dagger to the power N means I put one pair in the ground set of my trap, then I add the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, I make a pile of pairs. But what happens is, if I make a pile of Cooper pairs, eventually I cannot just pile the wave function up because I start to violate that occupation numbers for fermionic momentum states exceed one. So in other words, the Cooper pair wave function, if I start with one pair and add more and more pairs, gets completely modified by Pauli pressure. And that's why the bosonic operators, or these pair operators, don't fulfill bosonic commutation relationships because they know that there are fermions <coughs> inside and you cannot just do what you would simply do with a bosonic operator. You cannot put n bosons into a quantum state, as you of course can do most beautifully when you put n photons into an optical cavity. So the physics is really hidden there, and to give full credit to Bardeen, the BCS limit is completely the opposite limit, where the Pauli pressure exerted by the Cooper pairs at each other completely dominates the picture. Since I'm over 80 and met Bardeen and saw some of his interactions, I think it's not unfair to add that many very distinguished scientists build their career on a certain vision and get quite upset and attack other ways of looking at things, uh, similar things. Linus Pauling was a great scientist. Uh, he gave the young people who discovered quasi-crystals a hell of a rough ride. <laughs> okay, and Bardeen was a great man, but great men have clay feet, and uh, that was one of the reasons, I think, why he found it difficult to look at things from a different angle. So, so it's, you know, easier if you're not at the top of the mountain to uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> see the valleys and the hills. Well, my perspective is simply, uh, I've played so many years with those Einstein condensates, and we all enjoy, if the physics we know, we suddenly discover in a new system. Maybe that's what I try to share today. Okay, but let's now move on from fermions which attract each other, and we've talked about the physics of the solid curve, the BEC BCS crossover. What happens when we now exploit another aspect of the Feshbach resonance, namely Feshbach, namely atoms which repel each other? And what I want to show you is that the many body physics, the many body physics of attraction is pairing and pairs of fermions can both condense, or kind of both condense, if we take those generalized pairs. But if we talk about what is the interesting many-body physics which comes due to repulsion, well, the answer is it's itinerant ferromagnetism. So I want to talk to you now about our study of repulsive fermions. And uh, since I say the phenomenon is itinerant ferromagnetism, I want to say at the outset that we saw interesting phenomena, but, and this will be the punchline in 20 minutes or so, but in the end, we were convinced that this system does not show itinerant ferromagnetism. So I don't want to advertise a positive result, it's a negative result, but I think it's equally important to have a negative result, because we know now that a certain simple Hamiltonian 
will not lead to ferromagnetism, as was believed until recently. So, with that, let me first explain to you why repulsive interactions lead to ferromagnetism. So, what I want to discuss is what is the physics of a two-component Fermi gas. So, we are again back to the blue and to the red marbles. The Hamiltonian has the kinetic energy in the red and in the blue state. And all I add to the mix is a short-range interaction between, and it, since it's a short-range interaction, the Pauli exclusion principle only allows red and blue atoms to interact at short range. So red and blue atoms, equal fermions, are not allowed to be at the same place at this time and experience short-range interaction. 